morning. Again, it's always uh, great for me to, you know, the time of the month to be able to come back and join all of you here at the Gormley site. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's uh, great to be back. And as we continue our series, before we do anything else, why don't we open with a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you, God, for gathering us here as your people. Um, we thank you, Lord, that in um, all of our lives in every situation, Lord, we know that your presence goes before us. And so, Lord, as we delve into your word here this morning, we invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, to illuminate the text, that you would use it, Lord, to speak to us, to convict us, and to challenge us, Lord. And so, as we begin, God, we give this time to you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, as we begin, and again, we're continuing our series, The King is Coming, uh, I want to begin by asking you to think about and define a word that I'm going to put up onto the screen. Okay, so uh, you get ready, and when you see this word, you can just think to yourself what you think this word means. So the word, Christian. And so just take a moment now, what do you think that word means? If someone asks you, are you a Christian, what does that mean? So as you think about that, you would think, especially in a church, probably in a room filled with Christians, that everyone here would be on the same page as to the definition of this word, Christian, but not so fast. A very popular author, uh, Andy Stanley, we referenced him before um, in the U.S. So way back in 2020, uh, 2012, um, he came out with a book and a uh, curriculum study entitled Christian, It's Not What You Think. And so Andy Stanley, in this curriculum, he argues that the word used most commonly to describe followers of Jesus, Christian, in fact, often bears no resemblance to what Jesus wanted his disciples to be known for. And the reason for that is because, according to Andy Stanley, the word Christian itself is not clearly defined. And so in one of the lessons, he states, the problem with the word Christian is that it can mean whatever you want it to mean. There are Christians on both sides of every political issue. There are Christians on both sides of every legal issue. There are Christians on both sides of every financial issue. You can hide behind Christianity all day long. You can define it, redefine it, misdefine it, undefine it. You can do all kinds of stuff with Christian. The word Christian can mean anything you want it to mean because the word Christian is not defined in the New Testament. And that's the problem. And so if you actually uh, look up this curriculum, Andy Stanley goes on to say there's actually only three places in the New Testament where the word Christian is used. And in each case, it's not actually the Christians calling themselves Christians, but they are the non-Christians calling them Christians, and it was actually meant as a negative thing, like a more of a derogatory term when it was used. And there's only three places in the New Testament where the word Christian appears. And so according to Stanley, when we are asked, are you a Christian? Well, that's actually a problem-loaded word because it can mean different things to different people. So some people might think, oh, because I come to church on a regular basis, that makes me a Christian. Some people might think, oh, you know, if, as long as you're a good person, then that makes you a Christian. Or others perhaps, oh, because my family are Christian and I grew up in a Christian home. And so therefore, that makes me a Christian, right? The difficulty is because Christian itself can mean different things to different people. And why I share this with you is because, again, as we think about what that means to be a Christian, but yet if we're not clear on understanding what that actually is, then according to Jesus, as we'll see, there are significant consequences to misunderstanding what it means to be a Christian. And if we go to our passage this morning, and so we're continuing on in Matthew 25, uh, where Pastor John left off last week, um, I want to point you today, actually, uh, at the, uh, to the end of our parable in verse 30. 
where the parable ends with the fate of the third servant. And it says there, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And why I want to begin here is because I think sometimes when we look at this second parable in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, we usually uh, focus on the lesson and the theme of stewardship, on how we're to be good stewards of the resources that God, the master, gives to us. And of course, this is true and accurate of the parable, but today I want to take us in a slightly different direction that's related to our series, The King is Coming. Because within this parable, sometimes what we fail to notice, or maybe we, we just kind of brush it off, is that there is a very strong warning embedded in what Jesus says in this parable. And so picking up from where Pastor John left off last week, so Pastor John had uh, looked at the first parable, the parable of the ten virgins, and uh, reminded us, right, as a lesson to keep watch, the importance of being prepared for Christ's return. And so in that respect, again, we point to the third servant, right, of being prepared for Christ's return, right, the return of the master, because the reference in verse 30 to the darkness is, in fact, is in fact an image used for hell. Because we know this because similarly, earlier in Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, Jesus essentially says the same thing. While the son of, uh, verse 12, chapter 8, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is important to note because like I said, we tend to focus on the fact that the third servant in the parable was not a good steward. But then the overall point that we want to make is to be a good steward. And so we don't usually make too much of this last verse at the end. But what I want us to note is that the servant is cast into the utter darkness, into hell. And as an extension of that, whenever we look at this parable, then perhaps most of us would never think that we are that third servant. Right? I'm sure that for most, we, that thought does not cross our mind. And some commentators actually will argue, well, the reference here cannot be that the servant goes to hell because all three servants are servants of the master. And so what they mean by that is, well, all three of them are saved, right? They're servants. But today, as we'll see, I want to make the argument, well, no, the reference here is the servant being cast into hell. And we know that based on the same language that Matthew uses previously in his, um, in his gospel, that it is clear that the third servant is cast into hell. And I'll explain that a little bit, but what I want to get us to start to think about more intentionally is, well, is that surprising to you? That in the parable, one of the servants of the master is sent out of the master's presence into the darkness, you know, cast into hell. But what's more, as we get into this, what I want to ask is what if, what if you are that third servant? What if you are that servant? And I want all of us to consider this morning that you know, perhaps that reality, that truth, may not be as far-fetched as we may think to just brush it off. And the point that I want to make that we will come back to, right, is a very simple point, but this is very important. Know what the master expects of you before he returns. Because you don't want to end up on that day that the master returns to find out that you were the third servant, that you didn't make the cut basically. And so let's get started um, this morning and unpack what might be a fairly familiar parable um, to many of you here. So like I said, Pastor John started last week uh, from Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13, the parable of the ten virgins, talking about preparedness, the importance of being ready and keeping watch. And we continue um, and essentially uh, on the same theme, keeping watch, in that keeping watch isn't a passive thing where as we wait for Jesus to return, we just sit there and twiddle our thumbs and wait until he comes back, right? There are things that the master expects while 
he is away. And so that's where the second parable in chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, gives us more insight. And specifically, our parable today addresses the question of while we wait for Jesus to return, what are we to do? How are we to live in this present age? In other words, like we said, what does the master, Jesus, expect of me from now until he comes back? And so as we launch into this, just as a very brief summary of the parable, um, just so that we're all on the same page. So verse 14 begins with the word for. Now that word is usually a connecting word. It's a clue that this next upcoming parable that we're looking at is is connected to what came previously. So the parable that came previously, but more specifically, the last verse of the previous parable, verse 13, watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. And then four, and then into our parable. So our parable, a man goes on a journey. But before he leaves, he calls his servants together, and then as it says, entrust to them his property. Now, verse 15, it says, To one servant the master gives five talents, to another two, and then the final third, one talent. And one thing that we can note here is this word talent. And so in the ESV version, there is a footnote at the bottom that says a talent is a monetary unit worth about 20 years wages for a laborer. Uh, But there is debate on that. And so if you read various texts and commentaries, there's debate as to what a talent represents or what it is. Um, Some saying that first and foremost, it's not monetary, but it's actually a weight. It's it's a unit of weight. Um, We'll talk about what the talent represented later. But for now, um, we can simply say that this shows that the master had immense wealth, that he entrusts that to each of the servants. So even the servant with the one talent is entrusted with an immense richness of wealth. And so after that, verse 16 to 18, we're told what each servant does when given their respective number of talents. The first and second servants with their five and two talents respectively double what they had. So five to 10 and then two to four. However, the third seven, uh, servant with the one talent, we're told in verse 18, simply digs a hole in the ground and then hides his master's money. And then after verse 19, a long time passes as it says, the master returns to settle accounts with each of the servants. And so the first two servants report their gains. And it's interesting to note that they are commended exactly the same way by the master. In verse 21 and 23, it says to both the first and second servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of the master. However, the third servant then comes up to the master. And what he says is the reason... He basically tries to explain what he did. He says, verse 24, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. And perhaps it might be a little bit surprising, or maybe not, to which then the master responds to what the servant's reasoning was for what he did. Verse 26 and 27, he says, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. And we see after that exchange, the third servant's talent, that one talent is taken from him, given to the one who has the ten. And in verse 29, Jesus shares this overall principle. He says, For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And finally, the parable concludes, like we pointed out at the beginning, with the third servant being thrown into the outer darkness, a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, as we get into this, I want to you know, just point out the warning that is embedded in here at the very end of the parable, the fate of that third servant. And circle back to the question to get us thinking again, are you that third servant? Are you that person? 
And you might wonder, well, how would I know? How would I know if I am the third servant? And I want to answer that this morning uh, by giving you three warnings that we can see as, given from our, as taken from our parable. And so three warnings. Are you the third servant? Three warnings. Number one is this. Understand what the master expects of you. Understand what the master expects of you. So in the case of the first and second servants, like we said, the commendation from the master gives us a hint as to what he expected from the servants. And so, like we said, the commendation was the same for both the servants. And so that tells us something, that the actual you know, amount and, and, uh, and what the servants did isn't nearly as important um, in the story, but it's just more you know, the result of being productive, right? Being, having a positive return. And so we see here the word good, right? Good and faithful servants. So good, this word good used here indicates that a person is useful or purposeful. And specifically, this word here, good, is also the word that is chosen when moral goodness is implied. So being morally good, to have good character, right? Honesty, ethical, righteousness, that's good, good servant, but then also faithful. A faithful servant then meaning trustworthy, reliable, or loyal. So in other words, both the first and the second servants proved to be trustworthy, proved to be reliable in carrying out what the master had entrusted them with. Right? They're good and faithful because the master can trust them to carry out what he had entrusted to them, the wealth. And what was entrusted to them? Well, like I said, some will say the talents, um, and maybe because the word in English, we tend to think like abilities, talents. So some will say that the talents represents resources or abilities. However, a, uh, one commentator, uh, Warren Wiresby, points out, well, talents are in fact different from abilities. And we know that here in this parable because in verse 15, the talents are given to each servant as it says, according to each of his ability. And so the talent can't represent abilities because that, as we see in verse 15, is something else. And so rather, according to Wiresby, he says the talents represent opportunities to use our abilities to serve Christ. Opportunities to use our abilities to serve Christ. And if we take this approach, this understanding, then what the master expected from the servants is to be trusted to use the opportunities to serve Christ according to the master's wishes. In other words, what the master really, well, if it boils down to it, what he expected of the servants is faithfulness. Faithfulness. So in this parable, faithfulness is demonstrated in the work or the act of the first two servants trading or investing their given talents in order to multiply them. Right? That is um, the, uh, the evidence, that, that is the, the sign of faithfulness, the faithfulness as seen in the work and the act of investing and trading what the master had given them. So in other words, making good use of the opportunities to us so as to produce a positive return. And so if that's the case, and we, as we talk about faithfulness, well, we can then ask ourselves this question as well. Well, am I being faithful to the master's wishes? And as I ask that and we think about that question, we can also point out two things that would impact our faithfulness toward the master. And so the first is this. Number one is familiarity. So I want to point out, right, how did the servants know what the master wanted or expected of them? Because if we read the parable, look in the text, the text doesn't say that the master had to tell each of the servants what exactly he wanted them to do with the talents. He, the servants simply knew to go and invest in the case of the first two. And in a way, that also then explains the state of the third servant in verse 24 when he makes, gives this reason, I knew you to be a hard man, right? So he's basically rep misrepresenting the master who wasn't like what he was making him out to be. In other words, the third servant didn't truly know or he wasn't actually familiar with his master. 
And what we can draw from that, as you see written here, is that to be faithful to the master, the, how we know what to do, what opportunities, what he expects, you must be familiar with him. And so for us, this is why spending time building up our relationship with Jesus is so important. Because in doing so, in growing in intimacy with him, you also become more and more familiar with him. And when you're more and more familiar with him, then you're able to recognize the opportunities to serve him. But then you also then know what he expects of you regarding those opportunities. And so that's the first thing, familiarity. But secondly, as well, fruitfulness. And this is also an important point to note because essentially this is what the first and second servants are commended for, right? It's also important to point out that the work that they did, the act of being faithful, uh, resulted in a positive return for the master. And again, the point then we can take from that, faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. That each servant worked with what they were given according each to their abilities they put the money entrusted to them to good use in some way, and they were successful. Right? They received a positive return on their investment. And again, the exact amount not being important as it's each according to their own um, abilities. And so hence, the master's response to the third servant then. Right? He says to him, even if you had just put the money in a bank, at the very least, there would have at least been interest earned. And so we kind of get uh, some idea of the mindset of the master. It's not the amount that he's concerned with, but it's the positive return that even if the third servant had just simply put it in the bank, that would have at least produced really the minimum positive return. Right? All to say that fruitfulness, so the outcome of our faithfulness toward the master, matters, right? Fruitfulness matters. Now, earlier in uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus makes this exact point that true followers of Jesus, so versus the false prophets that he's describing, true followers will be known by the fruit that they produce, right? The true followers will produce fruit in essence. And so again, to sum up here, right? Understand what the master expects of you. So what does the master expect? Right? Faithfulness. Faithfulness as impacted by our familiarity with the master, which then also results in fruitfulness for him. And so that's the first warning we can say. Understand what the master expects of you. But secondly today, number two, don't ignore or misprioritize your opportunities to be faithful. And this is a big one too. And so I'll just say, right, the second point and the third one to come is mainly focused on the third servant and how the master um, responds to what the third servant did. And so here, the third servant, it's a, quite a dramatic contrast from the first two. And right off the bat, it can be noted that in fact, this servant did nothing wrong. Right? He wasn't acting unethically or immorally. In fact, some commentaries point out that it was common. It was a common practice in that time for people to hide things for safekeeping by burying it in the ground. Because then that way, nobody but the person who buried it would know where it was and also what it was that was buried there. Right? It was actually common for people to do it back in that time. However, Again, given what we had said about familiarity in the point before, then the third servant should have known the expectation of the master. And the fact that he acted this way just to bury the talent indicates that he either was not familiar with him, or perhaps worse, he had some familiar familiarity, but yet still chose a different course of action. And that's something that I want to kind of narrow in on, that he probably, right, being a servant, would have had some familiarity with the master and who he was. And so the likelihood is yet, so he kind of had an idea, but yet he chose a different course of action. 
And that is an important point to draw out today. Because what we see then is that unlike the first and second servants who were concerned with the master's affairs, this third servant was not. He was selfish. He was concerned with himself. And we can infer that by the master's reaction in verse 26, calling him wicked and slothful or lazy. And so um, the servant was wicked. It was wicked in the sense to receive these, uh, these resources, the money from the master, but then fail to use it to, the, to his best advantage, whatever the motive of the servant might have been. And so very simply, this third servant didn't want to be bothered caring for his master's resources. That, you know, even putting it in the bank would have involved record keeping and management. And so he clearly chose not to even do that. And it was a hard pass for him. And what he did do was maybe the, most, the easiest and the most convenient for him, but not for the master. In fact, the phrase that's spoken by the servant as he hands this one talent back to the master in verse 25, where he says, here, you have what is yours. One very subtlety that a commentary points out is that when this term is used in Jewish transactions, here, you have what is yours, it's basically saying, I am not responsible for this any further. And so he's basically, the servant is handing it back to the master saying, here, I am not responsible for this any further. And so you can perhaps understand from the master's perspective why he'd be infuriated with that response. And what I really want to emphasize again for us this morning is that, again, we can assume to some degree by virtue of being a servant that the master, uh, that, that, that uh, a servant to the master, that the third servant had some knowledge of what the master expected or what he wanted, right? And a, a positive return on investment. But the point is, yet he chose a different course of action. And I want to get us to think about that, right? How many of us, while we may have some idea of what Jesus wants in our life, yet still chooses a different course of action? Because many of the master's expectations for us as followers, as disciples, are actually made clear in Scripture. So much so that we can even just even boil it down to two key passages, the great commandment to love the Lord with all your mind, soul, heart, and strength, and to love your neighbor, love others. And the great commission, make disciples of the nations. Right? What the master expects is actually, you know, pretty clear. But yet again, how many of us choose a different course of action? Actions that put us first, put our needs first ahead of the masters. That's the case of the third servant, that we simply prioritize other things above the wishes and the expectations of the master. And so hopefully as you think about it, you can see being the third servant is not as far-fetched as we may think. But thirdly as well, third warning, beware of making excuses. And so, um, again, we look at the parable. It's obvious that the master knew his servants very well because since the one that he entrusted with the least was the one that let him down, right? So verse 24, verse 25, um, uh, like we said, the, 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 servant, the third servant essentially makes an excuse instead of realizing that from the start his responsibility was to serve the master to the best of his ability, And again, the words of the servant to the master really reveal that self-centered character that he had, accusing the master of being hard. But really, what this was was an attempt on the part of the servant to cover up his own irresponsibility. And we can put it another way, it was basically a subtle form of rebellion against the master. Rebellion in that he was not being faithful. He was not doing as the master expected of him. And two things, as you see on the screen, that I want to point out about the third servant. So first, like we said before, right, he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. He buried the money, which was a legitimate course of action common in that time. And I'm sure he thought that too, right, that he did nothing wrong. 
And secondly, that we can note as well that the reason that he had for doing what he did probably made perfect sense to him. Right? After all, he gave the master a, you know, a legitimate reason for what he did, or for why he did what he did. But yet, what we see from the story, even though he did nothing wrong, even though he had a reason for doing it, that yet it did, it did not matter in the end to the master. Now, similarly, in Pastor John's parable, I'm sure the five virgins that were left out had a very good reason why, right? They ran out of oil, so they had to go quickly to get some oil and come back, right? Legitimate reason. But like we said, what we see, that it does not matter to the master at the end. And this is a stern warning for us, a stern warning for what you are doing, how you're living your life now with what the master has entrusted you. That you may think, right, there's, you're not doing anything wrong. And in fact, you probably have very good reasons for doing what you're doing. You have good reasons why you have prioritized what you have prioritized in your life. But yet, we see the point here in the parable, if you are not living faithfully in a way that results in fruitfulness, no reason, no excuse, however legitimate, will save you from the consequences. But whatever, however good, however legitimate they may be to you, Right? No excuse or reason will save you from the consequence. And the point being, right, we don't serve God by doing what we want and what we think is best, but rather we serve him by doing what he commands us, what he expects us to do, even when sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. Now, after this, Jesus, in verse 29, gives a spiritual principle, we can say, which is, in essence, another repeat of what he had also said earlier in Matthew chapter 13. He says, For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so if talents represent opportunities, right, to the one who is faithful, in those opportunities. More opportunities will be given. But to the one who is not, then even what was there, what he had, will be taken away from him. As one author puts it, success breeds success, and failure compounds until there is nothing left. And that leads us to the fate of the third servant this morning. And again, some will argue that the servant, by virtue of being a servant, right, is already saved. Because then otherwise, if that wasn't the case, well, then isn't Jesus then promoting in order to be saved, you have to, you have to work, you have to do something, you have to produce something in order to be saved. But I want to say no, right? That is not what Jesus is saying here this morning. This is not the, um, the message here that you need to work in order to earn your salvation. Because we need to keep in mind who Jesus was speaking to, that he was speaking to the, the, the leaders, the nation, the people of Israel, and speaking to the situation that they found themselves in, that for some of the Israel people, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, that they thought that by virtue of their heritage, that they were safe. Right? In, in other words, the fact that they were Jewish was what would save them. And so in that sense, the third servant addresses those people, the ones who thought that they were okay, the ones who think that they're in when they're truly not. And so another way to put it, you know, the third servant didn't exhibit any faithfulness because he didn't act on the opportunities that was entrusted to him. He didn't invest the talents given to him, which then did not lead to any fruitfulness. And a fruitfulness, according to Jesus, like we said, is an indication of a true believer. Then this third servant, though he considered himself a servant, was not a servant truly in the eyes of the master. See, what we can observe being emphasized here is that those who are faithful will be fruitful to some degree, according to your ability. But then the third servant then, in his case, he does not represent 
a genuine believer, a genuine servant, we can say, as shown by his lack of faithfulness leading to fruitfulness. And it's also shown in the fact that he didn't truly know the master, or at least he didn't think it was important enough for him to live or act according to that knowledge. And so that makes it all the more important, again, as we see, again, this warning that is embedded in this second parable that I ask you again, are you the third servant? Because perhaps, like some in the nation of Israel, you may think that you're okay by virtue of being Christian. But again, like I pointed out Andy Stanley's example at the beginning, Christian can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But the warning here is misunderstanding what it truly means to follow Jesus. Your future eternity hangs in the balance. And that's what we see here, defined in Jesus' parable of being prepared, right? Waking up for his return. Is that jit? Uh, sorry, genuine or true Christians or disciples will be faithful to the opportunities given to them by the master. And those works, those acts of faithfulness, which demonstrates their faithfulness, like the two servants investing, will result in some level of fruitfulness, right? a positive return for the master. And as you kind of process that, if you think, well, isn't that a little extreme? Right, that in the end for this third servant that he would be cast out into the utter, uh, uh, to the out, uh, utter darkness. But then I want to point you to the book of James. Um, and um, a while ago at the main campus, the young adults studied the book of James. And, and, and we had said that James himself, half-brother of Jesus, was heavily influenced by Jesus' teaching and his ministry while he was on earth. And so if, if you read James's letter, you see a lot of references and, and stylistically that, um, how James teaches that's very similar to how Jesus taught. And so um, I want to point you to one place in James chapter 2. And so I'll just read you um, a section of it, but you'll see. Right, starting at verse 14, where James writes, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And what's very interesting here, if you can catch it, is that James is making the exact same point as what Jesus warns in the parable today. Except in Jesus' case, he is very explicit in what happens to the person who possesses a dead faith. And so again, we circle back to this, like the question today, are you the third servant? Is your faith dead? Because that is the hard and painful truth that we need to take seriously and consider because many who consider themselves Christian will have misunderstood what that actually means and what the master expected of those with genuine faith. And so the warning again is do not be the third servant. And come back to our point. Know what the master expects of you before he returns. And again, I'll say again, while works do not save you, however, your faith is proved genuine by your works. Right? The fruitfulness that is an outcome of your faithfulness. If you this morning sitting here, if this kind of like, startles you a little bit or, you know, gets you thinking, well, that's good, right? And, but I also have good news for you, 
if you're kind of questioning now um, your own relationship with Jesus. And the good news, the great news, is that as of right now, this moment, it is not too late because Jesus has yet to return. And so it's not too late to change. But again, take the warning seriously. When we say, you know, our theme for the year, wake up, the king is coming. This is what we mean. And in the words of Jesus, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so if you're, you know, kind of question, if you still have questions and you're not quite sure, you know, talking about faithfulness and what that actually might look like and how, um, how like, what, what, are, what, what are we actually doing when we're being faithful? Um, there is one more section of Matthew 25 that Pastor Rosa will uh, preach from next week. And so she's going to talk about that because, again, the parables are related to each other. And so what comes afterwards will also give us further insight into this, into this warning. But for today, for, um, you know, hopefully, again, um, it's meant as a serious wake-up call for all of us here. That just because, you know, we think, you know, we're Christian. Right. Do you truly know and understand what that means? And so just uh, as an FYI, and Andy Stanley in that curriculum points to a better word to use, and that's the word disciple. And so wh- whereas Christian is vaguely defined, if you look at the New Testament for what a disciple of Jesus means, that's actually very clearly defined. But I'll leave you with this, right? Don't be caught on the day of the master's return finding out then that you are the third servant. There is still time today to change, to repent, and to live your life in a manner that is worthy of the calling and the expectations that the Master has placed upon you. So let's close off our time with a word of prayer today. Lord, we come before you, God, in recognition um, of all the sins and all the distractions and all the temptations in our lives, Lord, that prevent us from truly, um, not just believing, Lord, but living our lives in obedience to you. Lord, we also repent and we recognize, Lord, um, just how easy it is for us to downplay um, the conditions of our hearts, making excuses for ourselves or even having good reasons for why we do what we do. But we recognize, Lord, that in the end, as in the example today, that it won't matter. And so, God, we pray to you and we ask that you, Lord, would give us the courage and the strength, Lord, to change. And so we pray to you, Lord, change our hearts, O Lord. Make us and mold us and shape us into who, Lord, you truly desire us to be, that we may be faithful to what has been entrusted, the opportunities given to us, that on the day of your son's return, we will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so God, by your Holy Spirit, empower us, help us in this quest, in this journey. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.